This interviewer is named Margaret Lacey, and on screen is Philip Sula, uh, who was the combat engineer commander during World War II, and date of birth 823-15. Uh, Mr. Sula, we can start in way back, such as where you drafted or did you enlist, or wherever you want to begin. All right. Well, I was in a construction business, so therefore, I thought I'd serve in the Corps of Engineers. I entered the military approximately, or I did on the 17th of March, 1942. I was drafted. So therefore, on six, 600 hours, oh, 600 hours, I took the Culver Line, which is a subway in New York City. My destination was Whitehall Street, down on Lower Broadway. I entered this Whitehall Street office with many men being all draftees, and we had to go through first a physical. Everybody had to strip down and be checked by the local doctor who was assigned, bend over backwards, forwards, and filled out certain forms. And on or about 1,200 hours, we were given papers of all the men, I, I was told to carry these papers for all the men and report to Fort Dix. They gave us fare to, to enter the bus, take the bus, and we took it down to Penn Station. From Penn Station, we went to Fort Dix, New Jersey. We come to Fort Dix, New Jersey, and this is a whole new world for me. Never was in the military before, never thought about it. Uh, we were signed in there and assigned barracks, and I had to stay around there for about 10 days. I practically did nothing. I knew how to keep out of doing extra work like KP, knew where to hide out. <laughs> and then eventually, every day I had to see if your name was on a bulletin board. If it was on a bulletin board, it would be an assignment to tell you where you're going or where you're going to be stationed. One day I found my name on a board. I'm assigned to Fort Belvoir, Virginia, which is the home of the engineers the Engineer Training Center. I arrived at Fort Belvoir and I was put into basic training and we had non-coms, sergeants and, non and PFCs and so forth and they were like the king of the world. The PFC was the meanest, the sergeant was the meanest men as you see in the, sarge in the movies with the hat over his nose and glaring at the soldiers and making him look lower than a grasshopper. All right, we start basic training. Exercise early in the morning, 5.30 in the morning. They would turn on the lights and chase everybody out <laughs> and in for breakfast, and then starts basic training, learning how to march, etc., etc. We were doing this for approximately two and a half months. When I completed my basic training, I was assigned to go further on at Fort Belvoir to a water purification bat, uh, battalion, a water pur purification school. I stayed at the school for about two to three weeks learning how to purify water, starting from base, basic, setting up the pumps, the, the chemicals, etc. I finished water purification in about 10 to two weeks, and I was assigned to a, a battalion being formed at Plattsburgh, New York, called the Plattsburgh Barracks. I came to the Plattsburgh Barracks. I was, young, I was made a corporal, incidentally, when I left water purification school. So when I came to Plattsburgh Barracks, I was one of the few men who was experienced on water purification. I had to teach the course to many of the men at uh, Plattsburgh. And I was there approximately, I would say, about two and a half months, maybe three. And we were on Lake Champlain, it was a great place, on the lake. And uh, I was a bunch of men here from all over the United States. At about two and a half, three months, this battalion re receives orders that they're going to Casablanca, North Africa. But I was going to be left behind. For some reason or other, I did not know why. They clear out, and I am left all alone 
with about two or three men at the post, a very large post. I, I received orders to report to Fort Belvoir, Virginia. I'm assigned to Officer Candidate School. I didn't realize I was eligible for Officer Candidate School. I found out when I took my IQ test at Fort Dix, which ended up around 2 o'clock in the morning, I was given an IQ test. And uh, I made nothing of it. However, I find out later on when I'm at Plattsburgh Barracks, I scored approximately 141 on my IQ, which was pretty good, they claim. And therefore, I was eligible for Engineer Officer Candidate School. That's why they kept you back when the others went, I guess. Because they weren't, I didn't receive orders yet from uh, headquarters. The orders came later as I was waiting at Plattsburgh Barracks. I received a couple of days leave. I went home to New York to visit my folks and so forth. And then I was to report to Fort Belvoir Officer Candidate School. Officer Candidate School is a very grueling performance. Uh, they get us up at 5.30 in the morning, have to go out and do ex calisthenics, and then it's going to school. You're given loads of books to carry under your arms, and we have to form in lines, lines of three, and you're supposed to jog in cadence to every classroom. The classrooms could be anywhere from 200, 300, 400 yards apart, or maybe a half a mile apart, and you have to jog through cadence, sounding your TAC officer, who is a second lieutenant, is with us all the time, and he's sounding off, and we have to march to cadence or run to cadence. These classes would last approximately an hour, such as map reading, the use of weapons, use of artillery, engineering, how to build a bridge, how to uh, uh, figure out trusses, which each truss will carry, etc. And this program goes on for 90 days. After the first month, they start dropping quite a few boys every, every two weeks. You look at the bulletin board, if your name is on a bulletin board, you're leaving. You leave as a corporal. If your name is not on, you go on for another couple of weeks. Well, anyhow, this goes on. I'm in my last two weeks. I see I made it because I, my name is on a bulletin board to report to the uh, post clothing exchange where I be, will be given $200, $250 credit to buy my uniform. So therefore I made it. I am now a second lieutenant. I receive some off time to go home and await orders. I receive orders. I'm to go overseas on or about, I think, about the uh, first or second week in March. Term of the year, please. Pardon me? The year, 42. 40. This is early 43. Right. Early 43. I have to report to a port in Staten Island, and on this here, on this here pier in Staten Island, there's a couple of thousand men <laughs> being assigned to various ships. The convoy will have approximately 30 to 40 ships in the convoy. All right, we assigned a ship. Uh, I'm assigned the SS Mexico, some old steamer, and uh, I'm given a stateroom with an army chaplain. The other men, the enlisted men, are going to be below in a hold. They're going to sleep in hammocks approximately four to five high, one on top of the other. All right, we leave at night, and the next morning I get up, we're out at sea. You see nothing. All you see is a stream of boats as far as the eye can see, a convoy. And on the outside of the convoy, we have destroyers going back and forth, checking against enemy submarines. This goes on for quite a while, and I'm assigned at certain times to go down in the hold to see what's going on with the men, to see that there's order down there. It was the worst place to be because the men are seasick. They're throwing up. Where are they throwing up? And 55-gallon drums. The stench is terrible, but the men don't mind it. After all, they're gambling, playing cards, and jostling with one another. 
and I had to do this several times on the voyage. A couple of days later, we find the convoy seems to be split in half. I see half the ships are gone. I noticed half the ships, I understand, are going to the English Channel, and my convoy is going to North Africa. I arrive in North Africa, let me see my notes, in early March, and I arrive in Casablanca. It's early March, about a week or so, I am given orders to proceed via railroad to somewhere in Tunisia. I am to ride to Tunisia in, in boxcars, which they call uh, 40 um, it's written on a box car, and eight chevaux, eight horses. All right, the enlisted men are in these box cars, approximately 35 to 40 men, one on top of the other. And the officers are given a separate box car, which we have approximately eight officers. And this trip takes approximately eight days. About the fourth day, the, the train pulls into a station called Tlemcen. Tlemcen, I, I assume, is in, uh, I'm sure, is in Algeria. In Tlemcen, they're changing engines. And while they're changing engines, I take a walk in the yard and I notice a Pullman train on a siding sitting empty. I go over to the uh, yard foreman. I say, I want that Pullman train hooked up to our train. He says he can't do it. I says, you can do it. You will do it. Well, being we had weapons, he didn't, and we're officers. He's a civilian. He hooks up this train, this Pullman car, and how do they do it? They push it with manpower. They get a lot of Arabs to push this thing, and they hook it up to our train. All right, now with living in luxury, we have a Pullman car and the other men in these 48 box cars. Get up one morning, I find a couple of Arabs riding in with us. They got on during the night. We knew nothing about it, and they're sitting in with us. We want them off the train. They refused to get off. Well, we pushed them off the train as the train was going pretty slow. I've seen them rolling down the siding, rolling down the ground. We got rid of them. All right, I finally pull into an area somewhere south of Constantine, on or about near Tebesser and Kasserine. When I come into that area, I meet up at the 1st Infantry Division, who who has a camp set up for replacements coming in. Our 1st Infantry Division came in at Algiers early in 42 for the invasion of North Africa. I joined them sometimes in March. They were down to two officers in my battalion. I, I, I stand corrected. I, I was down to two officers in our company, which I joined later on. Company, headquarters company, down to two officers. And I'm given jobs to go out now to clear a minefield. I know nothing about clearing minefields. So I meet my sergeant, who I first seen a couple of days ago. He happens to be regular army. And I'm, officer, I'm an officer candidate. First thing he says to me, did you bring your books, lieutenant? I said, no, I left them home. He said, good, we don't want people to read books while they're doing a job. He said, we're going out to clear a minefield, and it's going to be done during the night in total darkness. He says, you'll listen to Papa, and I'll teach you everything you have to know about running this platoon. And being regular army, I had to take orders from the sergeant. Well, anyhow, he says, you're going to go through this minefield. We're going to breach it approximately 10 yards by whatever the distance is. The Germans were pretty nice. They put up signs. So we should be aware there's a minefield that says Achtung Minen. And the sign is written in German, Achtung Minen, and cross skelly bones to let you know it's dangerous to go in there. Well, we start, to, uh, he tells, the sergeant tells me, you have to lead the men, you have to show leadership. If you show no leadership, they're not going to follow. Okay, I have no choice, I'm going to show leadership. And we're going in total darkness. The men have to follow me. And I have a watch on with a luminous dial. I hold it up, and they're following me. My men start to remove mines. And after going about 20 to 30 yards, 
my sergeant says, Lieutenant, you did enough. You showed the men how to get started. You go to the rear. We'll finish the job. We finished the job in the early morning, and uh, it was a job well done for our infantry to go forward, the 16th Infantry. After we did many thing, many uh, mine removal jobs in North Africa, we fixed roads, we put in bridges over culverts that were knocked out, over wadis, which are dried out stream beds, or they're full of water during the rainy season. And in a dry spell, they're a deep depression in the earth. So sometimes we had to bridge them, and other times we would bulldoze the, the sides so our infantry and vehicles could get through. Well, anyhow, we, uh, this war was coming to a close on or about the end of uh, early April. The Germans about giving up. We had numerous casualties. Another story I could tell, I went out with a half track with one of my young boys. He was a young fellow. I thought he was 18. All right, he, we go out in this half track in a Stuka German dive bombers coming down towards us. This young lad got up with his machine gun off the half track, a 50 caliber heavy machine gun, and he hits the Stuka, and the Stuka keeps diving and it doesn't stop and hits the ground. He brought down a Stuka, this young boy. I finally asked him, what the heck are you doing in the military? I found out you're only 17 years old. This was a fraudulent enlistment. You should be going home. He said, no, I'll be 18 shortly. I want to stay on. Lo and behold, this man stays on, and about two weeks later, he's killed walking over a mine. So he lost this young lad. He had no business being there. Well, the war ends on or about the end of April, I believe, in 1943. And the division is going to go back towards Algeria. Algiers. Algiers is a long trip, maybe a couple of hundred miles of a rugged terrain. And our division is going to meet in Algiers somewhere, Algeria somewhere, Algiers, the city of Algiers. Our battalion is placed about 10 to 15 miles out of Algiers, and we set up a camp there, a, a tent camp. We do some basic training. We learn how to use a bazooka, which just came overseas. Never used a bazooka, which is a tube where you put a, a grenade or some sort of uh, missile in the back and fire it. And as soon as we used this bazooka in, in camp, the, uh, the shell exploded almost as soon as it left the weapon. <laughs> it was a dummy, but it exploded in front. We found it was faulty ammunition, and the colonel said, we're no longer going to use this bazooka. Send it back for more research and development. This was in Algiers. In, Al in Algiers, we had some rest and re relax, R&R, re &R, rest and rehabilitation, whatever you want to call it. And we spent a little time at the Hotel Aledi, who was a base for the 8th Air Force, who covered the Mediterranean area. We were off limits at the Aledi. This is only for Air Force officers. Well, we begged to differ with them, and we spent a lot of time at the Aledi Hotel, one of the nicest hotels on the Mediterranean. In about 10 to 15 days, we received orders we're going to leave for Sicily. We leave for Sicily on or about uh, the 8th of June. The 8th of June. And aboard a transport ship. And we're going to land approximately the city or town of Gila on the coast, southern coast of Sicily. And we, this invasion takes place in Gila. We had some opposition of small arms and light artillery fire, which our infantry and artillery silenced after a while. We came into Gila and traveled through areas, various towns like Caltanissetta, uh, Agrigento, if I recall. And uh, finally, we had 
up to a town of Troina, where we had a heavy battle with a German Panzer Division, called the Hermann Goering Division, one of the elite SS. We defeated them out of Troina. They started to retreat, and my company commander says, soon are you going to have a job here? They blew out a road around Mount Etna, the volcano Mount Etna, which is partially active most of the times. Mount Etna is a, a quite a tall mountain with a cone, and there was a mountain carved at the base of the, uh, the volcano. And the Germans knew this was a road that we had to use, and they blew out the sides of the road. It was now a straight, like a 45-degree triangle. I had to carve the road back into the uh, mountain. So I took a platoon of men, bulldozers, etc. And incidentally, the Germans zeroed in on this mountain because they knew we were going to fix the road. And as we go to fix the road, they're going to hit us with 88s from quite a distance. Well, I had to do this job, and it was a very narrow road to go up there with our vehicles. And we started working on this road in about four or five hours, we finally hear some artillery zooming in. You could hear the whistle of the artillery coming in. If you hear it, you don't have to worry. If you don't hear it, it's too late. Well, anyhow, the artillery didn't get us. We, they, their, their shell fire wasn't too accurate. Now we had to turn these trucks around. It's a very narrow road, very difficult. So we carved another niche to turn our trucks around. And I told the men, we'll take these We'll board these trucks on the run. The trucks will not stop to board men. You'll take it as it's moving slowly. We finally got out of, the, got out of this area without any loss of men. And our infantry division pushed the Germans completely back to the coast, where I believe some of them may have been evacuated and the rest were taken prisoners by the 16th Infantry and other regiments like the 45th Infantry, etc., I also had another incident there where I was sent out with a group of men, my platoon, and we're taking a rest behind a big boulder. It must have been about 20 feet high, maybe 20, what am I saying, 20 feet high and about 30 yards wide. All of a sudden, I see a group of men running. I asked, what the, I asked one of the men, what are you running for? The Germans are throwing 88s at us. That's heavy artillery from a distance. I says, you got to stand there and uh, uh, proceed. No, we're going to run. I couldn't stop them. They weren't my men anyhow. Anyhow, they started retreating. And I said, when you see a retreat, it's the worst thing when the men have to retreat in disorder. You can't contain the men. They just keep running. This was a new artillery, a new unit, the 45th Infantry. They just came overseas, had brand new uniform, brand new shoes. Well, one of my men incidentally gets hit by some shrapnel, and his leg is bleeding profusely. I yell for a medic. I can't find a medic. I ask one of the sergeants to take care of him. I can't take care of that. They can't stand the sight of blood. <laughs> so being the lieutenant in charge, I had to take care of him, and I, make a, I form a tourniquet below his knee and stop the bleeding. I put a tag in there when the tourniquet was applied, and I left a note that tourniquet should be released every 20, 30 minutes to get blow, blood flow in his leg. And I was waiting for some, some truck to pick him up and take him back to a rear area. Along comes a weapons carrier with about 20 dead bodies. And these dead bodies are facing outwards with brand new shoes on them. My men saw it take off the new shoes to replace their old shoes, and I put this wounded man on top of the dead bodies. And he finally goes back to a VAC hospital. Incidentally, about eight months later, I get a letter from this boy who lived in Utica, New York. I don't remember his name. He, he did very well. His leg is in good shape, and he was home. And from there, in Sicily, we finally end up, at the end, there was sometimes early September. We were in Sicily approximately three months. The war was over in Sicily, and we were told to turn in all our equipment. We're going to England. Be ready to leave with just what you carry on your back. Incidentally, during that time, they invaded, Nap they invaded Italy. 
Ma Clark was invading Naples and he had a hell of a time. They thought Ma Clark might have to pull back and get back in his vessels and retreat. And they told the 1st Infantry to be, be prepared. But be prepared, we had no equipment, we had no weapons, nothing at all. Well, lo and behold, about the second or third day, Ma Clark finally pulled his men together and the alarm was over, we're going to England. I, I am assigned a boat that is going to leave from Syracuse, uh, Syracusa, the coast of Italy, and I'm going to go on the SS Sterling Castle. It's a ship that used to go from Liverpool to Durban, South Africa, and it was a cruise boat to take passengers. I'm assigned this boat, and I'm supposed to take approximately, approximately 60 men with me. And I, I come aboard the ship, I walk up the gangplank, and one of the officers, naval officer, says, go back. And I said, why? He said, you didn't come up and salute the flag. Well, what do I know about saluting the flag on a naval vessel? Well, I go back, come up the gangplank, and I salute the flag. He says, okay. I said, where do I go? He says, you sleep up in the officer's country. Where is that? That's on top of the deck, all the way up on top of very good view of the scenery. And I said, where do my men sleep? He says, they're going to sleep on the deck. I said, why can't they sleep with the rest of the men down below? No, that's for, the, for our English troops. The Americans will sleep up on the deck. And incidentally, if they don't have their bedroll cleaned up at 6 o'clock in the morning, we flush the decks down every 6 o'clock in the morning. They're going to be flushed down with the hose. Well, my men had to be up at 6 o'clock, get their bedrolls back together, and clear the decks. Oh, the trip took about approximately 10 days, and I'm now in Liverpool, England. I arrive in Liverpool, England. I meet my, I'm told to go to Charmouth on the south coast of England, facing the channel, where I will meet up with our battalion, a part of our battalion anyhow. Battalion is about 800 men, and they're going to put about a company, A Company, is going to be in Charmouth. I was in A Company. When I get to England, A Company, I made a first lieutenant. And the first thing, I, I was given a chore. The captain says, Suna, you're going to Bournemouth to pick up the payroll for the company who hasn't been paid in three months. So there's quite a payroll to be picked up. I'm given a command car with two men armed with rifles and a machine gun to pick up lots of money. So when I came back after picking up this money from uh, Bournemouth, it was a couple of hours ride back and forth, I hand the captain the money, said, no, you're going to pay the men. I said, don't I have their envelopes, their payroll envelopes? He says, I'll give you the envelopes. And it's listed on the amount each man is to receive. Well, I said, how am I going to break it down? This is in pound sterling. I don't know a pound from a truppence. He says, you've got to break it out now. I says, I'm, I don't know how to do this. I don't know what a pound is equivalent to. Here's a chart. Gives me a chart. And I have to start breaking down the pay, and all the men are standing in line waiting to get that pay. Well, I finally make, it, make the payroll. I find at the end I'm short approximately $140. Captain says, you eat it. <laughs> I said, somebody received too much money. He said, that's tough. He said, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to let you do this job next month. Maybe you'll gain or you'll be ahead next month. Well, lo and behold, I have to do this job next month. And this time I'm ahead $110. I said, this is the last time I'm going to do it. Get some other officer to do the, the payroll. Well, he said, you did your job. That's enough. <laughs> well, we happen to be in England approximately nine months. During this nine months, we had a lot of training, etc. And... I had leave in London several times, and while I was in London, I went to see a show, Panama Hattie, with some American actresses, etc. And while I'm walking down Piccadilly, I hear buzz bombs coming over. You could hear the whistle or the buzz of these bombs being sent over the channel. I never heard a buzz bomb, but here they are. If you can hear them, you're in good shape. If you don't hear them, it knows you can figure out their landing. In a short, in the inside of a minute or so, you could hear a tremendous explosion. 
It means a buzz bomb probably landed maybe a mile away or two miles away. They traveled at almost supersonic speed. While I had my run in London, I made about two trips to London and various other places. They also took basic training again in the Bodmin Moors. This is a godforsaken place in this, this they call the strong country, somewhere in South West England. And where we had artillery fire, small arms fire, and basic warfare, which we can expect at the Bodmin Moors. Finally, it comes down to around the early part of June. We're getting ready for the, I would say early part of May. We're getting ready for the invasion of Normandy. And uh, the invasion is supposed to take place, we have no idea, but sometimes sometimes in June. Well, it comes around the 1st of June. We're told to pack up and get into our vehicles. And before we got into these vehicles, all our vehicles were waterproofed. What do I mean by waterproof? All the engines are covered with a certain grease or wax, a putty. So if they're submerged, the engines will operate. The exhaust pipes of each vehicle has an extension up about six, eight feet to be above water, above the vehicle. The air intake to the carburetor is also extended to pull in fresh air to the carburetor. All the trucks, vehicles, tanks, etc. are waterproofed because when they go off the landing craft, they're possibly going to be submerged in water. So all these vehicles are waterproofed. Now we're leaving for the coast. Our unit left somewhere around Weymouth, England. We got along aboard the transports, sometimes around, I would say about the 3rd of June. While going to this area, Weymouth, there's, the roads are lined with English people, girls, men, etc., waving us good luck. Everybody knows about the invasion. <laughs> I guess the Germans did, except... The GIs didn't know where they're going, but everybody else knew about the invasion and that time we were going to leave. I'm pretty sure the Germans knew we were coming, but they didn't know where we were going to land. I understand they thought we were going to land as the closest area was Calais, which was closest to England, about 20 miles. But it didn't happen that way. Anyhow, we board these vessels, and my men and I are sleeping on the deck next to our landing craft. Our landing craft are up on the deck. There's quite a few landing craft. These are made, I think they're called LCMs. They carry about 40, 50 men, 40 men, let's say. Or they could carry a vehicle. And early, I would say around 7, 8 o'clock, 900 hours, 0900, our ship drops anchor. And they start launching with the booms, putting these landing crafts into the uh, English Channel. English Channel was running with a pretty good tide, anywhere from 5 to 10 foot tide. They throw the, uh, the rope nets overboard. The rope nets are, though, are such that the men could climb on these nets, climb down on these nets, and get into the landing craft. Each man is carrying approximately 60 to 70 pounds on his back. So it's quite difficult to get into a landing craft. The landing craft is going up and down at least 5 to 10 feet. I told the men, when the landing craft comes up, you jump. And then when it goes down, wait till it comes up again, the next group will jump. Well, I'm the last man to get on the landing craft. I had to see that my... 40 men and got into this landing craft. When it came to me, I get over the sides of the boat, I get my feet into the net, some of my equipment gets stuck into the net. And when I finally let go, the boat happens to be at a slow depth, and I fall about 10 feet, and I land on top of the men, which was okay, they caught me. Now I have a young fellow, a coxswain, 
he must have been about 18 years old, a Navy, a Navy boy, and I told him to gun the ship. But we don't do that yet. He said, we're going to circle until we're, we see a signal from the beach that we're ready to come in. There's a beach master who got there before everybody else. And we're going to land somewhere in, I think it's Verville Saint Laurent, in that area. When uh, we circled and circled until we got notice where to come in. When we brought the craft in, I urged my coxswain, faster, faster, let's get this boat on land. He said, I can't do that. Who's going to push me back in? I said, there'll be a bulldozer on shore to push you back in. I was told there would be bulldozers to push these landing craft back in. Well, anyhow, he got in as, I, he got in as close as he can, and he lowered the ramp. My men got out. Some of the men got in as high as the water is about, let's say, two foot deep. And that's pretty good because other people landed and they were sub completely submerged in water. And when I landed, I noticed dead bodies floating face down. I noticed other landing craft upside down. It was havoc. Artillery is booming overhead. The Germans are shooting overhead trying to hit the vessels at sea from the, uh, the gun emplacements. I would say the gun emplacements in many cases were German 150 millimeter, which is a damn big shell. Others had the famous 88s, 88 millimeter shells, small arms fire. However, by the time I got there, a lot of small arms fire was contained by our 16th Infantry who preceded us, who went ashore first. By the time I got ashore, a lot of the uh, artillery fire was silenced by our heavy naval ships at sea who were pounding the uh, fortifications. We also, the Air Force also bombed the area during the night to silence a lot of the fortifications in the rear of these uh, in the rear of these uh, gun emplacements. I finally land with my men and go up the defile, and I lost no men on the landing. I reach the defile, and I go up there until I finally reach a road that's running parallel with the uh, English Channel. Before I got up there, I had what you call satchel charges. What is a satchel charge? A satchel charge is a container or a box of TNT about about a 18 inches square, maybe a little less, and it has an igniter that when it's pulled, it'll detonate. And we extend the igniter with a piece of string and we put a pole on it. It's called, now it's called a, a pole charge. I, I was told to neutralize one of the gun emplacements. When I went up there, they silenced it by firing into the embrasure. We had men firing weapons into the embrasure to keep these German guys from looking down on us. When we got close, my men put the pole charges inside the embrasure and they pulled the string and you heard a tremendous Whoomph. And uh, two of those went off. And finally, all you saw was a little smoke coming out. I went back a little after a few minutes, uh, 10 minutes later, looked in. There was a door there. The door was open, a metal door. You're looking at it as two dead Germans fast asleep. To me, they were sleeping. You look closely, there's blood dripping out of their mouth. They died from concussion because it exploded in a small little area, maybe about 10 by 10 by 10. When that goes off, tremendous explosion in there. And it sucks up all the oxygen, I guess, and it collapses their lungs. Well, that was done, and I continued up until we hit the, the, the road. It's not a main road, but it runs parallel with the channel. And there, a little later on, I, round, I met other units of our first A Company. And A Company finally met other units of the battalion. There we were given orders to go out 
and clear mines along the road. I was given a job to clear mines along, I think it was N13 or N15, I don't remember the exact number, which is a main highway going from Cherbourg to Paris. I was heading towards Cherbourg, and uh, my men started to probe the sides of the road. There were no mines in the middle of the road, but they had it on the sides of the road, the shoulders. And uh, the reason they could do that, because it was soil, a uh, uh, gravel, and you can't tell when they bury a mine, they cover it up. They, they wouldn't place it in the middle of the road because they wouldn't be paving the road and putting a mine there. So they probed with bayonets and mine detectors. Finally, one of these corporals yells, Lieutenant, see what I got here. I said, what have you got? He says, I got this German mine, I'm, I'm defusing it, but then I see a wire from the mine going further. I dig further and I find a big shell, which is approximately 15 inch diameter. The, the sergeant comes up, takes a look at the shell, he cleans it off a little, and it has, like he guesses, USS Massachusetts. It's a, probably a shell that came in and it was a dud. It had many duds come off these battleships that never detonated. Well, anyhow, it had, had the man pulled the mine, it, they would all be killed in an area of about 30 yards when the shell goes off. So I had a choice either to try to pull the mine away and try to cut the wire or else attach a cord to the mine and go back approximately 150 yards or so. We had to join up a lot of string and so forth to get a distance and he give it a yank and all of a sudden we had a load explosion. When I go back there, I had a crater in a road approximately 20 foot in diameter and about 15 foot deep or 10 foot deep, let's say. And there we are with this big hole in the, in the road. Along comes my company commander. He said, what the hell did you do, Sona? You, you killed the main highway. I said, I wasn't going to take a chance and uh, pull a mine attached to a 500-pound a shell. Well, uh, he got a bulldozer up there. And before you knew it, in about an hour, we had the road filled and passable again. We were able to run vehicles over the road. And our minefields were removed. The road was usable. We slept in hedgerows during the night, which is depressions in the ground to separate uh, like uh, two, three acres from another acre. They're squares, and this is how the French uh, have their lands in squares, and they're separated by mine, uh, uh, hedgerows. A hedgerow is a depression in the ground like a V, approximately about five foot across, or six foot across by about five foot deep and it's full of uh, hedges, all kind of growth. And we slept in those hedgerows. At night you could hear the, see the rats running around in the hedgerows. And also at night, German bombers are going overhead and they're dropping bombs and you could hear the booms in the distance and you could hear the leaves rustling. It's probably uh, exploded bombs are hitting the trees from a distance, you could hear the rustling. And, uh, and you could also tell the difference of a German plane at night and an American plane at night. There's some distinct difference between the engines of the roar of the engines. So you could, the Germans have a roar of an engine that goes up and down, like the curve would go up and down, and the Americans was a steady roar. Well, this then came a time, all right, let's see what happens then. I'm given a, I was told after the infantry cleared our area and they went back quite a distance, I was given an assignment to go to Bayeux, B-A-Y-E-U-X, uh, some sort of small city, I would say, a town in France about 20 foot beyond the channel, maybe more, 20 miles beyond the channel uh, approximately. I'm supposed to take some men there and put all the plumbing and drainage and all these lines back in operating order. 
take some men who know something about plumbing and so forth, and being I was in the construction business, piping business, I was given that job. I took about a dozen men with me, and I came to this hospital in Bayeux and started to go to work, and a lot of the stuff was dismantled, destroyed, so forth. They had no water. And we were going to use this as our general hospital. When I got there, there was quite a few doctors and nurses, and they were setting up, and they were bringing in water by uh, water purification trucks and so forth. And as far as sanitary facilities, they were digging slit trenches. I was told to get everything operating, the toilets, water, and so forth. My men worked on it for quite a while, a couple of days. In the meantime, at night, we had lots of nurses, which we never saw before in a, couple, in a year or so. And nurses come over to my guys. We finally got some real men here. We're sick and tired of these doctors. We want real men. <laughs> so they had real men for, for a couple of days and so forth. Now the, I, I understand my company commander wants to know where is soon. He's, he's away almost 10 days. I'm going to go up there and find out what's keeping him there. He comes up himself. He sees all these nurses. He decides to stay for a couple of days himself. Well, after about two weeks, we finally go back to our company. In the meantime, our infantry division is heading towards St. Lou. I'm going with the 1st Engineer Battalion. We're heading towards St. Lou. Before we get to St. Lou, a couple of miles from St. Lou, we can't go any further because the Germans are occupying the town. We can't seem to dislodge the Germans. Uh, they call it an airstrike. This is the greatest airstrike I ever saw in my life. There's approximately wave after wave after wave of flying fortresses going overhead. And we said, gee, we can't, I must, I can't believe the Germans are going to withstand this here bombing. It'll be terrible in that town. They're dropping bombs continuously. I must have stopped counting over a thousand planes. I understand later on there was almost 3,000 planes going over St. Lou. Incidentally, while this was going on, there was a, a general, Lieutenant General, I believe his name was McNair. I don't know if it's Leslie McNair, Eric McNair, a general who gets killed by a bomb that dropped in our line. A short bomb. These things happen. Bombs don't go where they're supposed to go. They end up short. And they killed General Eric McNair. That was his name, Eric McNair. Well, and finally the bombing lifts and the division is supposed to go forward and we said this should be no problem. There should be a lot of dead Germans there. It so happened it didn't work that way. When the, the division got close to St. Lou, the Germans came out of the holes in the ground. They were dug in. And they were fighting pretty they were pretty actively fighting us, keeping us out of St. Lou. After a day or two, they were overpowered by our armored divisions, infantry and so forth, and the Germans started to retreat. German 7th Army. However, they, they were retreating on a road called the Falais Gap, which heads towards Paris, the main highway, the Falais Gap, they called it. There was so much German armor and infantry on the Falais Gap that our Air Force came in. It happened to be a turkey shoot. They wrecked havoc on the German infantry divisions evacuating the St. Louis area. There was so much litter on the road, burnt out tanks, dead bodies, horses, you name it, artillery. How do I know this? Because I came in later after the infantry went forward, our armored divisions went forward. I had to clear the roads, get rid of all the burnt out vehicles with our bulldozers, road graders, push them aside. We had, the stench was terrible of dead bodies. You could count, you could hit, smell a dead body approximately 100 yards before you get there, or you could smell a dead horse, maybe two, 300 yards ahead of us. The Germans used a lot of horses to pull their artillery. They were short of uh, vehicles to pull their 75 or 75 millimeter guns. So I had a job to clear this area with my platoon and other platoons from other engineering outfits. And finally, our, we cleared the road. We had clear sailing. 
towards Paris. However, our infantry division did not go to Paris. They bypassed Paris. That was all political. The Germans, or rather the Americans and the French had a deal where de Gaulle will enter Paris and he'll be the savior of Paris and our American divisions will bypass Paris and go on further. Well, that's how it happened. They go on further and the French liberate so-called Paris. De Gaulle marches down, and everybody's throwing flowers and so forth. And there were some GIs coming in later on, marching in back of De Gaulle's men. We go on beyond Paris. We get to a certain area where they, I get orders. They want me to go to, I myself personally, with no other men, to go to a place called Epernay, which is close to Reims. I'm supposed to go to Bridge School, which is located on the Marne River. When I get to Bridge School, I report to a certain sergeant. His, he has a, a label on his, his chest, Sergeant David Walensky. He looked familiar, and the name sounded familiar. Sure enough, I, I remember this guy. He was in PS 205 with me in Brooklyn. We went through about the 5th, 6th, 7th, and 8th grade together with David Walensky. And uh, he was amazed to see me. I'm a first lieutenant. He's the sergeant. And he's going to teach me how to bridge the Rhine River. I mean, it was a whole uh, group of people teaching other officers how to bridge the Rhine River. The, the idea was our, our engineers in the States who had pictures of the Rhine River, they had photo shoots of the Rhine River where we're supposed to breach the Rhine River, cut, not breach it rather, cross the Rhine River. It's supposed to be upstream from the bridge at Rhymagen, which was a steel structure. We're going to put a floating, a floating pontoon bridge across the Rhine River. So at the school, uh, which is, they teach us how to use the equipment which is going to be a complete unit shipped from the States, which will have the, the floating pontons. It'll have the, uh, the bridge work. It, it connects the road work, rather, the roadways. And it'll come equipped with cranes, bulldozers, air compressors, with the exact number of uh, trucks to carry a complete bridge to cross the Rhine River at a certain point. And that's what I was supposed to figure out and bring it back to our battalion. However, it never got to, we never got to do this job, but I got to school to learn how to do this job. And eventually, a bridge was put across the Rhine River by some other engineer outfit, and they usually put up a sign, you're crossing the Rhine River by the courtesy of a certain engineer outfit. But before you could cross a river, you got to have infantry across the river uh, to go out at least a mile or two so no artillery or small arms fire c could hit the people building the bridge. So you had to get the men across, which was done by engineers in uh, what you call rowboats. We took them across with rowboats, no engines, no outboard motors, we had no things. They were flat bottom aluminum boats, and you ferried the infantry across on boats. That's how it was done. And, and then it was, it was, I think, before the Battle of the Bulge. I never got to that point. I was sent to do another job somewhere up in Belgium to go with my platoon, and I was called back before the Battle of the Bulge. I was called back during the Battle of the Bulge. They needed additional men. And at the end, I never did get there. For some reason or other, they went on ahead without my company. I myself had f probably found out I had enough points to go back to the States. If you had a, approximately about 100 points, you could be removed from combat areas and sent back to the States. And that I had, I accumulated close to 100 points because I came over to North Africa, Sicily. 
Uh, so I accumulated those points and I was sent back. And sometimes at, the, uh, at that period, the war was coming to a, to a wind, it was winding up. But it didn't wind up at the time. I think it ended up sometimes, I can't remember, was it in May or June or July when the Germans surrendered. And uh, that was the end of me doing combat engineering work. From there on, I was sent back to these, uh, these posts in La Havre where they rounded up all the men to leave back for the home to go back home to the States. And thusly my career ended at La Havre. Oh yeah, I forgot another incident. Back in Sicily, I and a couple of my men are riding down a highway and we go off the highway into the fields because the highway was was under repair and I'm riding along on a on a rough road, uh, not a road but a a, a field. And along, uh, my men are riding in, a, in a, an old two and a half ton truck with a metal roof. My man takes off his helmet and puts it on the side of the seat. Along, all, all of a sudden he's stopped by a general. The general happens to be General Patton, George Patton. He stopped my truck driver and says, where's your helmet? He says, on the side. He says, why aren't you wearing the helmet? He says, because if I wear the helmet, I go over a bumpy road terrain, my head is hitting the roof of the truck and banging up and down. So I took it off. Put back that helmet. Where's your officer? He says, I don't know. He points. Is that your officer down the road? I, he sees me down the road. I, was, I started to take off so as soon as I saw General Patton. He waves me over. So I come over. First thing he says, where's your tie? I says, no excuse, sir. Why is this man wearing why is he riding a truck with no helmet? No excuse, sir. He asked me another question. I yelled, no excuse, sir. He says, get the hell out of here. I was told when a general comes and talks to you, never give him any excuse. And that's my uh, run-in with General Patton. And after that, let me say, we were told to gather, the entire infantry division was told to gather the 1st Infantry Division on a large hill somewhere in Sicily, and General Patton is going to come there and apologize to the men, to the division. Why? A day or two before, General Patton walked into a field hospital and saw quite a few men lying in bed. They looked good to him. He said, why are you lying in bed? He, said, he asked the doctor, he says, these guys are shell-shocked. He says, there's no such a thing as shell-shocked. Get them out of here. Get him back in line. The officer refused. A medical officer doesn't have to take orders. Who's fit to serve and who isn't fit to serve? He found these men not fit to serve. He slapped the, uh, the doctor who was a captain, and he forced these men back into the field. The incident got back to headquarters. It got back to General Eisenhower, and he was told what he did was a very bad thing to force men out of a hospital and to slap a doctor or a captain. So he was told to apologize to the division. He rounds up our division, about 17,000 men sitting on a huge hill. I was thinking if the Germans only knew they could drop a bomb and kill the whole division at one time. And he gets up there and apologizes and he's actually crying how much he loves our men and loves these men and so forth, and he used all kind of foul language, how the Italian boys get a dose from their mother and pass it on to their sister. That's where he spoke of the Italian, and we had a lot of Italian men with us, and so forth. General Patton was relieved of his command, and instead of General Patton, we now are being commanded by General Omar Bad Bradley, a very decent general, nice general. Everybody liked General Omar B Bradley. As far as General Patton, he was called old blood and guts. It was our blood and his guts. Another incident of General Patton pulled. He wanted a unit from our engineers to go somewhere into Germany and rescue a prisoner of war camp. 
There's about 500 prisoners of war in this camp. He knew where they were located. And he wanted a, a company of engineers to go along with this group, a battle group, which would be about five, 600 men. Our, our colonel said he couldn't spare the men. We had other chores to do. He said, all right, I'll get other people. I found late, later on this group of men that he chose, General Patton, went into, deep into Germany, and they never got there. They were stopped by German soldiers, and they were, they were beaten up quite badly, and they finally retreated. And who was he going to rescue? His son-in-law. I can't think of his name. His son-in-law was a, a colonel who was captured in North Africa. And he wanted to get his son-in-law back out of his prisons to walk him. He knew where he was. And this fellow was captured somewhere near Preserti. And his son-in-law went all the way back from Italy, back to, Ger to Italy, into Germany. And he had a hell of a time until he was freed at the end of the war. That was another incident of General Patton. And that's about all I could say at the moment. Well, let me say these medals. Yeah. I got no medals when I left the service. Well, I was glad to pick up quite a few hundred dollars because I haven't been paid in a long time. And I never thought of medals. As far as medals were concerned, I found out later how it worked. The colonels, the majors, the captains, you write me up, I'll write you up for a medal. Now, you see all these high-ranking officers today, rows and rows of ribbons all kind of bravery, etc. A lot of them, they never saw half the things these enlisted men saw. They write themselves up one another and they receive these medals. I shouldn't say it, but that's how it works. Do you recall the day your service ended? Where? The day your service ended. My service ended? Do you recall that day? Well, my service ended. <laughs> I was glad to get away as soon as possible from Fort Dix. And uh, I took the train from Fort Dix to Penn Station, and I ended up in New York City subway and came home on a subway train with no fanfare, nothing at all. And I finally came home. I see there's a big sign on the front of my parents' home, welcome home, well done, and a big party inside with loads of people greeting me as I came home with a nice new uniform as a first lieutenant with medals, ribbons, not medals, ribbons. I didn't get the medals until much later on. Thanks to a senator of Georgia, I can't think of the name, a paraplegic senator, Cleland? Um, Max Cleland. I was told to write a letter to Max Cleland. My son-in-law happened to know Max Cleland. I wrote him a letter and I sent him my military records. And inside of a short while, I got the medals, came to me. Whereas, I had a form to fill out from the 1st Infantry Division, do you want your medals? I wrote a letter to the War Department six months before I got an answer. They're looking into it. Year after year after year, I would say four or five years, I never, they never answered me. And I gave up. And finally, my son-in-law mentioned he knows uh, Senator Cleland. Inside of a month, I got my medals. I also got the French Croix de Guerre, Avec Palm. I had the f following medals. I could read them off. I don't remember. I had the, uh, here it is, the Meritorious Service Medal with a palm. I got the French Croix de Guerre with palm. I got the European Middle, European Middle East ribbon with four battle stars and two bronze arrowheads. A bronze arrowhead denote, denotes an invasion, an assault. I made the assault invasion in Sicily and in Normandy. And the four battle stars are for North Africa, Sicily, northern France, 
and uh, so forth. I got four battle stars. And I got the American Campaign, the World War II Victory Medal, the French Four Regere, six overseas stripes. I served overseas 33 months. Three years, never came home. All I did was write letters, no telephone calls, nothing like that. It's a far cry. Oh, yes, I got a V mail. Mm -hmm. Incidentally, I used to censor the V mail. <laughs> Each officer censored the other's V mail. Well, it helped me in some way. I happened to get a military construction contract at Fort Hamilton. And I needed a bulldozer, I needed a crane. I happened to mention to an engineer officer I met there, he said, no problem, I'll give you the crane and bulldozer. How many men you want? I said, no, I use my own men. He's so glad to help another fellow officer. And I did quite a bit of military work for the Corps of Engineers as a, a civilian contractor. I ended up doing public works in many the large public buildings in New York City, mechanical, mechanical construction work, such as New York City subway system, where I worked on the signals, compressed air signals, etc. I worked at Ellis Island, put it back in shape, and I also worked at Metropolitan Museum of Art. We put in a fire sprinkler system, Museum of Nat, uh, Metropolitan Museum of Art, New York Public Library, Federal Building, etc. And that's the kind of jobs that I did in civilian life. I retired about 1987 to 88. I saw the photograph with the reunions. Do you get a chance to attend a lot of the reunions? I, I did attend some reunions. And uh, out on Long Island, we had a reunion. Funny thing, we come to this reunion. And uh, one of the enlisted men takes us to his backyard and he has a mock latrine. One latrine for officers and a separate latrine for enlisted men. Incidentally, when you come into an area, the first thing the men do is build a slit trench, one for officers and one for enlisted men. And another thing, when we captured these Italians in Italy, Sicily, we took over a lot of their uh, kitchen equipment. The Italian officers traveled in luxury. They had fine bone china, they had tables, chairs, stainless steel, cutlery, and we, uh, ac we requisitioned this from the, Ger from the Italian prisoners. The Italians also ran around with a lot of Vespas motorcycles, motorbikes, and we, we requisitioned these motorbikes from the Italian prisoners of war. They were funny people, the Italian prisoners. They wanted to be taken prisoners and we wanted to send them home. We don't want them as prisoners. Go home, we used to say. No, we want to be taken prisoners. And we refused to take them prisoners. We found out the Germans used the Italians as a shield in front of them. Before the Germans advanced, they put the Italians up first. They had utter disregard for the Italian soldiers for some reason or other. The Germans were more professionally, professional soldiers. Their officers were very professional. The Germans, when they were, when they were, uh, were captured, they were very Civil, never gave us a hard time. Neither the German uh, prisoners give us, give us a hard time. They, were, they behaved themselves, not like you have today. Did they do much about escaping when they were in the field? We never had any problem with escape. They had it pretty good. Why, why escape? Because he who lives and runs away lives to fight again another day. This way they went through the war and they came back and lived again to fight again or go back home. Can you remember anything? I hear it all the time. He has a good memory. You've been in construction. That was your full career, I take it. That's right. He keeps in touch with the other, you know, uh, I have another story I could tell you. We were in Sicily. And we come to an area loaded with tomatoes and corn, as far as the eye can see. And my man, gee, all this corn and tomatoes, we're going to have fresh vegetables. I said, you better hold on. 
why would the Germans just pulled out of here about an hour or two ago? Why would they leave this fresh corn and tomatoes? Something wrong. Something smells bad. I, I assume it must be mined. Well, sure enough, some of my men went in there and they found mines. So they got a few tomatoes at the fringes and corn, and I refused to spend the time to go in further to clear the area. It wasn't necessary. In the meantime, a friend of mine happens to come by from our artillery battalions. His name was Lieutenant Herbie Klein. We came overseas together in the same vessel. And I asked Herbie Klein, where are you going? He said, I'm a forward observer, which is a dangerous job. He goes out ahead of, uh, he goes out with the infantry and he calls back coordinates for the artillery to zero in. So I told him, be careful, Herbie, there's a lot of mines out there. He says, I know, I'll be careful. Well, about 10 minutes later, I hear a, an explosion. 10 minutes after that, I see some of his men, he had about two or three men with him, carrying a dead body. It's Herbie Klein. He got mangled up, hit a, de hit a mine, and he was dead. And his soldiers took him back, his men took him back, and that's the last I saw. That's what happens when you go forward mm. as a forward observer. We also had other incidents where I had a fire, uh, what do you call these weapons, uh, I can't think of the name, mortar shells, mortar fire. I was told to place a mortar fire on a German position and I had my men start using 60 millimeter mortars and we had a I was supposed to be up forward to call in the mortar shells. The captain tells one of the men, you're not firing fast enough. So the men decided to fire faster. <laughs> so one of the guys puts a mortar shell in. The other one, there's one on the right, one on the left. One puts it in on the right-hand side, and the other one puts it in on the left. He puts in his mortar before the other mortar comes out. Before you know, two of them are coming out, and the man that put the last one in loses his four fingers. The mortar knocks his fingers off, it's not funny, and the mortar shell falls short, and I'm not far from it. And, and I, the mortar missed me completely. I didn't get any shrapnel, but that was enough of that. <laughs> oh yeah, I had another story. Somewhere in North Africa, I'm out on my own on a reconnaissance, and I started to uh, and it came time to go to sleep somewhere, and I go into a tent with some other First Armored Division officers, and before I knew it, I was fast asleep, because I was tired as all hell. And uh, all of a sudden, a man comes over to me, shakes me. I said, what's the matter? He said, I want to see if you're alive. I said, what's the matter? He says, take a look over your head. There's a, a hole over your head in the tent. I said, why is there a hole? He said, I was cleaning my pistol. My pistol went off and shot a hole right through the tent. And I could have swear I thought I shot you. I thought it hit you. <laughs> I went back to sleep. <laughs> and those things happened. He was cleaning his pistol. He wants to see if I was alive. And You've given us so much to think about. I get There's so many things more. I have to be, I have to think back. I can't think back that far. After all, I'm going on, I'm 88 years old, and I think I did enough. <laughs> I said enough. Yes. You have to shut this camera off? It's a red light blinking. <laughs>